since this is National Poetry Month, April 29th, next Monday, we're going to have readings by Philip uh, Lynn Cooper and Ken Hepson. Uh, Lynn, uh, as you may know, has four books of poems. He lives locally in Halifax. And Ken has just uh, published his first uh, chapter of poetry. So that will be in this room at uh, 7 o'clock. And then next Thursday, the library is going to be closed again. We have some capital improvement stuff going on with new doors. But next Thursday, we'll be, uh, 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 be doing some tra staff training for a new uh, computer system we're putting into the library, new and improved computer system. So uh, we'll be close for that. And then on Saturday, June 1st, we have to migrate all of our data to the new computer system. So we'll be close that day, too, on June 3rd. Look it up with that. Open source. That's right, open source. You read the, you read the literature. <laughs> um, so anyway, as I mentioned, it's National Poetry Month, but it's also National Library Week. And today is Home Run Day. And Hank Aaron did his first home run in 1954 on this night. And William Shakespeare was born on this day. Oh, who is the so, first one? Maybe. <laughs> Hank Aaron did his first home run in 1924. No steroids. No steroids whatsoever. It's all pure. <laughs> so uh, I think it's an auspicious day for, uh, for our, two, our two authors. So I think Troy uh, is going to go first. And uh, I'm sure he needs no introduction as Vince does, but I'll, I'll do it anyway, so you'll, I'll fill in the gaps that people might have, okay? So, uh, Chard is the author of four books of poetry, The Double Truth, which was published in 2011, and was selected as one of the top ten books of poetry by the Boston Globe. Knight Mowing, University of Pittsburgh Press in 2005, Sharp Golden Thorn, March Rock Press in 2003, and Asleep in the Fire, way back in 1990, University of Alabama Press. His book of essays and interviews with seven senior American poets, Gavin Cannell, Ruth Stone, Lucille Clifton, Donald Hall, Robert Fly, Jack Gilbert, and Maxine Cuban, titled Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Staple Songs, Conversations, and Reflections on 20th Century American Poets, was published by Merit Press in 2012. He is the co-founder of the New England College MFA program in poetry and is a professor of English at Providence College. And he lives locally in Puppy for now, which is my place. Thank you, Charlie. Then I'll do a little intro for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, and for organizing this. And um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming. It's a great honor to be reading with Vince Canella tonight, whose stories I've been reading for several years now and just find it to be masterful. So it's just it's wonderful to be reading with him. Um, uh, we advertise this as uh, lyrics and fictions, uh, um, which is mostly true. I, I, I may read a few poems that have narrative in them. I think it's easier to understand poems sometimes that uh, yeah, tell stories than lyrics. People look at you funny when you read too many lyrics. Um, and then you start looking at yourself funny, too. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the world you're up to. Um, I'm going to read primarily from this new book called Interstate. I commute from Putney to Providence uh, weekly. Not this year, because I'm on sabbatical. But um, that's why I drive down the interstate quite a bit, down to the Mass Pike, and then over to 146, uh, and then down to Providence. So. Um, the, the, the title just came to me. I don't know if the book has a lot to, it doesn't really have that much. There's one or two uh, poems in the book that had to do with driving. But I realize that I, I think a lot uh, when I'm driving and I I even scribble on the other seat while keeping my eye on the road. Yeah. <laughs> and then try to figure out what the heck I've written and then try to stop. Um, but it also, just the, uh, sort of the double entendre of that word seemed to work pretty, pretty well. The idea of the interstate. Um, and I'll, I'm reading just one or two from uh, these other books. Um, I thought I'd start with a poem called uh, Goshawk, um, which is a poem about a northern hawk or a goshawk which attacked me at Green Mountain Orchards about 10 to 20 years, 20 years ago. Uh, I was actually in a little, in a section of woods right next to the orchard called Garland Pond where the hawk lived and used to fly through the woods at 60, 70 miles an hour attacking people that too close to the nest, which it did me. Um, 
But for the purpose of the poem, I moved the San Juan and Quintai uh, over to the orchard. Um, so the parts need to do what they need to do in order to get things to work. So the hawk came down and you know, tried to grab my head and took it off uh, with it to its nest. But it, uh, uh, just, it did succeed in scaring me and moving me away from the nest. Um, so this is what came out of that experience. Goshawk. How many times have I told this story? There I was ambling along in search of dessert inside the orchard when a goshawk dove on me with outstretched talons. There I was all dressed in cotton in the cool of evening, inspecting the trees for infestation when a goshawk harrowed me. There I was pinned to the ground like a reprobate with my liver exposed as a fresh hors d'oeuvre on a dusty plate when a goshawk circled me in figure eights. There I was crawling away behind the trees where the apples hung like grains and nothing I said reminded this bird of who I was. I felt like Prometheus. <laughs> Uh, so, a few poems from this, this new manuscript. Um, this first one, uh, I keep the windows open. I keep the windows open to watch the curtains fly as a sign of the old spirits on the move again, passing through. I take them in through the mouthpiece of my bones and let them out again. I stare at the oak outside my window, the one that holds its leaves throughout the winter. No matter, they say, with so many names, I call them just one. No matter, they say again, as I hold a thread to the eye of a needle and feel their stillness blow inside. Small black eye. The sparrow lay stunned but still alive in the periwinkle a victim of the window that appears as air in the kingdom of birds. I picked her up and placed her wing against my face as she came around. All the world, sky, grass, trees, shone inside her small black eye that was perfectly still as it stared at me like a stone that could see. Uh, this this is a well, I, have a, I have a friend who just becomes ecstatic at sunset. He goes out on his dock and just will not stop ooing and on for for 15 minutes. And um, it's very hard to talk to him when he's in this state. Um, uh, and even afterwards. Uh, so this is simply called the singer, and I I become. I'm sorry, I, I apologize to my friend. I've written this per poem in the first person. But imagine this person as um, just a friend of mine who's, who um, both suffers and uh, revels in, in this, uh, at this time. The singer. I sat on the dock at dusk and spoke to the fish who swam beneath me like ears with fins to hear my secrets then pass them on to the silence of the dark, clear water that holds everything in perfect confidence. What words come close, I whispered. The sky enters me like a sword with my own hand on the hilt. How to witness to what I can't express, the smell of lilacs, the dirge of loons. Make up the rest if you wish. Less is enough. Say I sound like one of the hosts, that I'm crying also when there's nothing you can do to make me stop. That I'm like the peepers, katydids, and thrush, with my own song, all call in the opera of dusk, or is it response? Mr. Handsome. A blue jay at the feeder turned to look at me. Nice haircut, I said, and he flew away. As for me, I let my hair grow down to my shoulders. But no matter how I wore it, short or long, I was always a sight to him. 
I spoke, he flew again and again. This one is just a little longer. It's called Eclogue, a pastoral poem about uh, <coughs> gardening. You know, the more you garden every year, the more you, of course, enjoy the bounty of the harvest, but also the more you um, wonder uh, what it's all for, I guess, in some ways. Um, of course, you love the vegetables, but it's easy to get too philosophical when you garden. Um, here's a, a few uh, epigraphs here. Part, of, uh, part may be more than whole. Least may be best. Uh, the poet Robert Francis uh, wrote that. He lived just down the road in Amherst for many years. Um, the second is from uh, Rilke, the poet, Rainier Maria Rilke. Earth, is it not just this that you want to arise invisibly in us? Is not your dream to be one day invisible? Earth, invisible? I made a list for each day which was enough since I was inclined to do too much in a single day. More than a dozen men sometimes in a couple of days, so drawn to work and blessed with strength, I couldn't imagine paradise without it. Much less remember the bliss that idlers canonized as myth more real than the history of days. Fix the bridge, weed the beans, till the corn, plant some chard. They waited to get that in. <laughs> I wrote in the box of my birthday, which in the rule of night became an order for that day, like all the other days that authorized my sleep to grant me another day as long as I saw the ruse of difference between each thing, then woke with the charge of putting my mind to the dream, which was my work in the garden, the plot that needed me and not the other in rows of text that merely bloomed, to be the genius of my own patch with only so many days to plant, grow, and reap. So, I gathered my tools at dawn and headed down to the field and jacked the bridge that had fallen in the rains, placed a stone the ground had made a million years ago for this repair beneath a beam that had lost its hold on the opposite bank, weeded the beans until it was time to rest, then sat for a while in the shade of a willow beside the stream, thought about nothing until it was something as part of the hole that was also whole for being connected to the most unlikely things, ant, pokeweed, mullen, worm, stuck my head in the stream like a lure for the big one that always gets away, walked back to the garden to till the corn, only to find the corpse of a mouse inside the case of the machine, back up then to fetch the ratchet and the little shroud to bury her in, slower this time than before, and grievous now one dead at least and maybe more from catching against the screen when I pulled the cord and it pulled back. Poor mousy, I cried, like burns. I should have guessed some creature was there after finding a snake last year, wound round and round the sprocket like another cord. So many dead inside the tiller, so much work recovering the bodies. House, housing, mouse, bridge, fountain, snake. I thought like the sky whose clouds erase its blues so perfectly. Like the dirt that smells of the hole and everything in it. Words were all. They came to me like birds to a tree and I wrote them down for nothing, for the trowel, for the stars to scan is nothing also. So much nothing at the end of the day. I called it darling. Uh, this poem is for <coughs> Jill Noss, many of you may have known Jill, who was a wonderful equestrian and person who lived in Putney and worked at the Putney School with me for a while and tragically died of cancer a few years ago, 2011. And uh, when she became too sick um, to take care of her horses, um, the little ones, the foals, became kind of wild because she didn't you know, have that human contact with them. And there was one in particular that became especially ornery. Uh, this poem is called Little Fucker. 
<laughs> the pain is less today, said Jill. I gazed out the window at the horses behind the barn. <coughs> How's that colt doing, I asked. Fresh as ever, said Mary, the hospice worker. Bit me hard on the breast this morning. Sorry, I said, as if it were my duty to apologize for the horse. As if I needed to feel the pain of another to know the calculus of pain. How it cancels out reason and lives on its own as the characteristic of love. How it needles a witness to lie for the sake of truth. I thought of paintings depicting the torture of saints. I thought of Job becoming whipped by the tongue of God. I thought of the time I stepped on a nail that pierced right through. The pain, I said to Mary as Jill fell off to sleep. The pain each day and silence. Pain and silence should be her name. And little fucker, too. Those three at once, what do you think? Peggy. Peggy's what Jill calls her, said Mary. So I'm calling her that, too. Although I don't feel she's a Peggy. <laughs> but what can you do? That's the name she comes to now. As if she knew it before she was born. This is a this is a poem called At the Co-op in Putney, Vermont, an opera. <laughs> and it's an homage to Allen Ginsberg. It's a, it's a couple of pages, and then I'll just have a few more after that. They're relatively short. Um, so from uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem, which you may know, at a, a supermarket in California, where he's strolling through the aisles, inspecting the fruit and the vegetables, and pretending to see Walt Whitman pointing his beard and wondering which direction he's pointing it in. And it's really a wonderful poem about the future of America, but in the context of this grocery store. <clears throat> and so um, I was in the co-op one day, and you know, about going down the aisles and thinking about um, that poem, and then had the sort of gumption to write this at the co-op in Putney, Vermont, an opera. Go ahead, I said to my neighbor in the Putney co-op who tells me he can't complain. Let it out. It's mid-April, there's still two feet of snow on the ground. Put down your bags and weep. <laughs> How many times must dear father Greybeard be your lonely old courage teacher, was what, which is what uh, Ginsburg called Whitman, walk down the aisles humming his tunes for us to start. The song begins in silence and grows to a buzz. We make it up as we go along and watch our numbers swell, 10,000 members who have eyes to see and ears to hear, who fly like a swarm to join us in our chambers. I'm singing now without knowing it, carrying the tune of main things, lamenting the prices with Bernie Sanders. My neighbor has joined in for no other reason than singing along as a member of the cast we call the multitudes of lonely shoppers. I roam the aisles with the sadness of America, juggling onions, blessing the beats. It's a long, it's a local stage on which the country opens like a flower that no one sees beside the road. The road. In my hungry fatigue, I'm shopping for images which are free on the highest shelf, but costly in their absence. The only ingredient here that heals my sight of blindness. I see you, Walt Whitman, pointing your beard toward Axis Mundi by the avocados, reading the labels as if they were lines, weighing the tomatoes on the scale of your palms, pressing the pears with your thumbs the way you did in Huntington, Camden, in New York City. And you also, Denise, Adrian and Hayden, these are great poets who died in the last 20 years. Denise Lester Talk, Adrian Rich, and Hayden Carruth. At the checkout counter with empty bags you claim are full of kombucha, almonds, and bananas. What can you say to those outside who haven't read your poems, who find it so hard to get the news from poetry, but die miserably every day for lack of what is found there? A quote from William Carlos Williams. It's night. 
The Connecticut slips by across Route 5. The moon is my egg and star is my salt. I score the music I hear in the carrots, scallions, and leeks in the frost of the freezer windows. The sup of traffic on 91 washes my ears with the sound of tires on blue macadam. The doors close in an hour. We'll both be lonely when we head back out on the long, dark roads to our silent houses. I touch your book and dream of our odyssey inland to the ground where we plant our oars and die where we hear the children's questions but answer with answers that can't understand, that they, they can't understand unless they've grown deaf to the best wrong teachers who dress the same and hear so well, who don't feel absurd and publish too much, who grow obsessed with sense and die confused. These are the lyrics to our sudden song in the aisles, the buzz of the swarm that goes unheard outside the store with our queen at the center. Uh, I was walking down to my meadow last year and uh, came face to face with a deer, which, which is pretty common. Uh, and you know that moment where you just stand there together for about 20 seconds and stare at each other. And you know, the deer thinks, well, who's this? And, I'm wondering the same thing, um, and then suddenly the deer bolts, and uh, um, and she's gone. Um, and so I did a little epigraph here from uh, the great poet Thomas Wyatt, the first one, the first son of tears. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, from his wonderful poem, who so this to hunt, I know where is a hind, which is the deer. Um, halfway down. The sight of a doe through the trees in the meadow. I stopped to stare at her, staring at me. The stillness arced between us then in a current that equaled strangeness over time. And since her stare was wild, so charged with fear, the moment froze on the line of sky and ground, mind and meadow. She turned eternal in her fleeing afore, transfigured, gone. I stood alone but double there as the man on the path and the memory of the man she carried with her beyond the meadow into the next meadow and the meadow after that where she returned me to the field of her forgetting in which I roamed like a deer myself remembering. Uh, read two more here. Um, uh, I've had a pet grouse for about four years who just arrived one day. They're pretty common, actually. Did you know this? Do you have any? Do you have any? Do you have any? Do you have a pet grouse? Yeah. 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 They come. They're they're the wood chickens, right? They come right up to yeah. some crazy time. chickens. Crazy. <laughs> and they they and once they become tame, and that's it. I mean, they love you. For, and you, know, they, you don't think they don't want food, they just want to hang around. And he used to, Rand, I called him Randy. He used to jump on the leaf pile on the tarp and I'd pull him across the yard. And he used to get up on the roof on the second floor and staring at me and just scare me. <laughs> writing. So it was great fun. Then he'd land, peck on the back of my hands when I planted in the garden. So it's, yeah, unfortunately, I haven't seen him since October. I think a barred owl died in my but four years is a long time for a grouse to, and and um, when I try, used to try and walk with him, he'd do this little dosy do You know, he'd, he'd run through my legs and like figure eights and just have fun with me and a little path down to the meadow. So I, so I feel it was like a square dance. So uh, so I wrote a little square dance call for him. It's called Grouse Call. Dosy do and say hello to Drummond Bird. Slow it down, then pick it up once and a half and let her go. It's right by right by wrong you go. Turn to your left and freeze the dough. Promenade to the field below. It may be the last time, I don't know. I'll amend a right with Mr. Crow. You can't go to heaven when you carry on so. Yellow rock, red rock, oh by Joe. Dangle now outside the no. 
timorous beastie, beastie. Um. <laughs> and this last poem is called Chains. I um, burned about eight huge brush fires last uh, fall after we cleared some land. And sometimes, you know, you have to stay almost all night with these brush fires so they don't burn down your neighbor's house. And of course, you see the neighbors looking at their curtains all night. Um, so, um, and you get all, you know, you get all smoky and dirty without even realizing it practically. So, um, this is actually the last poem in this book. Um, and this is called Chains. I'll end with this. I took the chains down to the hardware store to have them sharpened on the grinding wheel. It was the day before the day of rest, so I worked some more when I returned, gathering branches into a pile, starting a fire, tending the flames until they disappeared at dawn, and I went inside to lie with her, the queen of trees who had waited for me throughout the night, breathing her lullaby now beneath the quilt, emitting the sweet eternal scent of the future against my stench, leading me with her beauty alone into the dark, where I dreamed of the trees I felled, still falling, in that slow, intractable way they fall at first, then faster, in their swift descent that takes forever, it seems, despite their speed, since in the time between the second the tree begins to fall and the moment it hits the ground, a man has time to write his epitaph on a stone inside his head and lay some flowers as well on the mound that rises up before him like a wave wherever he stands. Thank you. So, um, Ray Cooper's here, and Ray will be with you next Monday. And Ken, oh, you snuck in. Good. <laughs> Great. Uh, and I forgot to mention, I don't know how this happened, but uh, Sydney Lee will be here next Wednesday, uh, first Wednesdays downstairs. She'll be talking, uh, giving a talk on Woodsworth and Coleridge, romantic uh, poets. So, glad I remembered to, uh, to mention that. <laughs> um, so, uh, my friend Vince Pinnell, I met probably one of the first people I met in Brattleboro, right, Vince? Uh, 1978, uh, moved here 30, uh, 35 years ago, and Vince was uh, giving a talk or a, a book signing at uh, Donnelly's Wine Bar. You really oh, yeah. have it. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Donnelly's Wine Bar used to be where uh, uh, Peter Havens is now. And uh, so I was uh, new to the new to the town. I was thinking, where are all the Italians? I couldn't find any. And then I see this. I see Vince Pinella on the other side. Uh, this is the book that uh, Vince did with his wife Susan, did the photographs, and so we met, and we've been friends ever since. We share a lot of things in common. We're both Italian American. We both have big noses. <laughs> Our families uh, born in uh, born in Italy, and I think uh, uh, you know it was it was a book that inspired me to reconnect with my roots and uh, go to Italy with my father to his uh, to his village in Calabria. So, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, it's been uh, fun keeping up with your writing, Vince, and seeing all that you do. Uh, so, the other side was published in 1978, and then his next book, Canal of Colors Island. It's called by Stephen Pressville, the perfect flawless gem without a false note anywhere. <laughs> His most recent book is the story collection Lost Hearts, which is, which is really good, by the way. I've read both of those. A suite of linked stories. One critic has said, with grit and not without some joy, Penella remembers old country and city life in telling detail, whether in the old country, the old neighborhood, or the suburban oasis. The reader is always at home and on edge simply because we are in the presence of a master storyteller. And I'll vouch for that. Tonight, uh, Vince will be reading selections from his novella, Disorderly Conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you all for coming here. It's, uh, 
an honor to be, to be with Char because he has such an ability to take ordinary experience to another level. And when I look at my writing, I feel like I'm still in, still flying low. But um, I'm going to read parts of a novel, this novel is called Disorderly Conduct. Uh, it's set in Queens in the early 60s. The main character is an 18-year-old kid named Buddy Sims who's been arrested along with his friend for assaulting a policeman. So I'm going to, I'm going to read three little selections which I hope will give you sort of the trajectory of the book. First one, uh, it's on a Saturday night after Buddy leaves his job. He works in an Italian delicatessen. He's going to take a walk for home. So I'll start there. Buddy left the store and paused in Scalzetti's alcove to adjust to the darkness. He zipped up his jacket against a biting wind and stepped down into the street. Notice this is different than poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different mood, different rhythm. So I'll start all over. He stepped down into the street. The deli lay at the intersection of Broadway and Roosevelt Avenue, where the subway and elevated line met with a hack stand and bus station. Buddy weaved through the stall traffic on Broadway and into the crowd around the station. The glass wall of Bigfoot's restaurant exposed the interior like a doll's house, and with the clatter of dishes, Buddy breathed an air heavy with motor exhaust and steam table food. The meatloaf and fish sticks and macaroni and cheese with red pimento he, he could never resist. Although he lived here all his life, the picture before him didn't evoke monotony or boredom, but home. Not the home of the apartment, too small for him and his parents that he would have to leave, but the home of his job with Scalzetti, with the hypnotic aroma of cured meats and strong cheeses inside the small store. That sense of belonging to the deli, to these lights, to the press of people, was now under threat, and the dread of an uncertain future was part of his daily life. He walked up to 37th Avenue and tried to enjoy the feeling of accomplishment from the rolled up bills in his front pocket. He worked hard for that money. It was Saturday night, and his friends would be up at the Golden Note drinking as if nothing had happened. They were the lucky ones, the ones the cops had chosen not to chase, but would somehow escape when they saw the squad cars coming. Buddy may have been the only sober one that night. He'd never been much of a drinker. Any dizziness or loss of control resurrected images of his father in the days before his AA cure. Mr. Sims would come home from the Roosevelt Avenue bars and pass out either on the couch or in the bathroom. Buddy had long ago fixed on a single idea to get out of the house as soon as possible. <coughs> that was the plan. Join the Navy, see the world, even learn the trade. The old salts returned to the neighborhood with hash marks on their sleeves and tales of whores in every port from Nice to Naples and Singapore. But the trouble with Officer D'Angelo had put an end to those plans, at least for now. But he continued up to 82nd Street where the stores were still open, their window spaces hung with evergreens and blinking lights, with Santa and his reindeer hovering over the woods. He stopped at Harvey's swank shop and studied the display of sports shirts and fancy cufflinks. He looked over his shark skin suit with a rolled collar shirt and matching tie and lapel handkerchief. The outfit was slick and dapper, but ever since the trouble, so much seemed frivolous. He had a decent suit anyway, dark blue, bought for court appearances. The trick in the courtroom was to look not neat but not flashy, a little poor, a little meek, Back straight, chin up, hands clasped as if in church. Not with his brow furrowed in anger and his arms defiantly crossed as at the arraignment when he tried to tell Judge Urbino that Stephen Antonelli hadn't tried to take D'Angelo's service revolver and that he, Bernard Sims, hadn't beaten the officer about the face and the body, <laughs> about the face and body as the prosecutor announced to a shocked courtroom. At subsequent appearances, he and Steve were silent facing the judge directly. They, ordered, they avoided eye contact with D'Angelo, who stared them down every time. An L train shook the ground, and Buddy passed Balfour's sporting goods, where he and his friend had bought their Spartan jackets, and then Fields' department store, where his mother had found the courtroom suit on sale. He stopped at a corner and remembered that confession at St. John's was still going on just one block. If only he could pray or confess his way out of the feeling that he'd done something wrong, not in trying to pull Steve away from the crowd, but in staying in a place where trouble was brewing. 
Yes, he could have walked away as soon as this started, and there would have been no shame except to himself. What had kept him there? Why hadn't the police realized that he'd been telling his friends to leave as soon as the Angelo came out of the shadows <coughs> twirling his nightstick? Buddy's real need was to tell his story to someone who would sympathize, even if it was a priest. Tell him how the punishment didn't fit the crime. But why lay his misery on some naive priest who would ask him not only to forgive the Angelo, but every cop in the precinct? <laughs> forgive them? It wasn't funny to think about this little reversal. Definitely not funny when they threw him in the back seat of the squad car with hands cuffed behind his back and a plain close cop on either side. The one on his left, a detective named Brian Knapp, said, when we're through, you'll piss blood. The other said, turn and face me. When Buddy did so, Knapp jammed a nightstick into his kidney and pushed hard. That's what I mean, he said. And he'd been true to his word, for both Steve and Buddy had blood in their urine for days. The squad car beating lasted until they arrived at the precinct, where Buddy was yanked from the car and pushed and kicked inside, with Steve behind him getting the same treatment. Their entry greeted with cries of, where are those cop fighters? The voices had all the joy of a surprise party. <laughs> And for a fraction of a second, now shameful to his intelligence, Buddy entertained the notion that the police had forgiven them, that the beatings in the cars were the end of it, and now they would all be friends and have a good life. But no, the voices were angry, and Buddy and Steve were pushed into separate rooms where the world couldn't go black fast enough. Uh, the next part comes uh, later in the book. It's a visit by Buddy and his friend Steve to Steve's grandfather in Brooklyn. Buddy and Steve turned at an L track and followed a street of three-story buildings with working stores below. Steve rang a buzzer on an unlabeled mailbox, and a woman's voice said something so mixed with static that Steve <coughs> rang again and cried out, It's me. Go out in the street. He needs to look. My grandpa always does this, Steve said as they went back out and stood near the curb. A window opened on the second floor, and a young woman with her hair and curlers appeared with a shadowy figure behind her that Buddy couldn't make out. She acknowledged them with an apologetic gesture and buzzed them in. Steve stopped Buddy before they climbed the stairs. One thing, he said, my grandpa's nice, but a little crazy. My cousin came to the window because he had to look us over. He's what they call a mustache peep. A long time ago, back in Sicily, he beat a guy to death over a woman. He was in his 20s and married. My old man and Uncle Sal were little kids. Then they all came over here because the dead guy had three brothers. He still thinks they might show up at his door. After all these years, Buddy asked, he's over 90, and the older he gets, the more he thinks they're coming. When he opens the door, he'll have a tile cutter in his hand. Just ignore it. <laughs> As they started up the stairs, Steve stopped Buddy again. The girl at the window is my cousin, Paula. She goes to City College, and my Uncle Sal is pissed because he doesn't want her out of his sight. Does she live here, Buddy asked? On the second floor, with Sal and Grandpa. My father's pigeon coop is on the roof, and he lives on the third floor with his girlfriend. What's she like? I only saw her once. He doesn't want me to visit him there. Why not? I think she has his kid, and he doesn't want me to know it. Just as Buddy was about to ask more questions, he felt Steve's hand pressed into the small of his back and pushing him up the stairs. Let's just go up, Steve said, a signal that the subject of his father was closed. Something about Steve's story cut to the basis of their friendship, and Buddy tried to grasp it as he climbed the stairs. Maybe it had to do with their fathers. Steve didn't live at home and had another family, while Buddy's father was home, but not at home, and he had another family too, the church. At the second floor, they smelled something cooking that Buddy couldn't recognize, an aroma neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Steve said, Father means my grandpa lives on them. He knocked on the door, which opened to the limit of a chain lock, and within that narrow space appeared an old man with a head of coarse silver hair cropped short. His mustache was a different color, gray as lead. Its waxed and pointed ends reached below his chin. 
Steve said, it's okay, Grandpa, as the old man looked Buddy up and down and then into his eyes. He's a friend, Steve added. The door opened wide enough for the boys to sidle into the kitchen, and when the old man closed it and reset the locks, Buddy saw that one hand held the tile cutter on a loop of twine, which he returned to a hook on the door. This is my friend, Buddy Sims. Mr. Antonelli, Buddy said, not sure whether to shake hands because the old man was still looking at him suspiciously. The uncomfortable moment was broken as Paula came from, entered from another room and said, he's fine, sit down. The curlers were gone, and with her head to one side, she was brushing out the curls. This is Paula, Steve said. Sit at the table, she said to Buddy. He likes it when Steve visits. She takes care of him, Steve said, referring to Paula. Reluctant to let his eyes linger on Paula, Buddy took her in like a shot of whiskey, fast and burning. This had never happened before. His throat clogged as if he might lose his power of speech, and he lowered his eyes to his folded hands on the table. He studied his knuckles and the trace of his veins and wondered if they would ever accomplish anything. The last few hours were already a rush of events. And now there was Paula. He raised his eyes to the warm kitchen with its dark yellow walls thick with the paint of generations. A holy calendar hung on the wall near a small refrigerator, and the lid of a porcelain pot rattled from the boil until Paula turned off the heat. Exchanging the hairbrush for a wooden spoon, she lifted the lid and stirred, releasing the aroma of beans cooked in oil, salt, and garlic. Once again, Buddy lowered his eyes to the backs of his hands to, sh to slow his feelings and avoid a burst of emotion which might have expressed itself in tears. He thought of the crazy old man with the tile cutter hanging on the door who looked as virile as a goat. Then there was the pigeon coop on the roof and Mr. Antonelli's girlfriend, one flight up. How could they live so close together? He couldn't ask that question and felt Paula looking right through him and reading his mind. She'd stop the word in his throat, even though he didn't know what those words might be. They took each other in. Paula had never met Buddy, but she knew he was the friend to try to save Steve. Other than that, she didn't know what to expect. Maybe a kid like Steve. She called her cousin a kid, even though they were the same age. This one didn't say much. Tall, his dark blonde hair combed straight back. Not parted, not stylish. He might have something special. But what was it? Aware of their reaction to each other, Paula asked Steve an obvious question, question to break the moment. So, did you visit your father? We had to talk things over, Steve said. I know what things, she said. My father told me what happened, that it's all supposedly settled. Supposedly, Steve said. She held Steve's look, both of them knowing what was best left unsaid, that the deal could still fall apart. Vigorously brushing her hair once again, she walked around the table to face him. Can you think that's the right way to do things? We don't think, we know, Steve said. You don't know. There are lawyers who specialize in these kinds of cases. Lawyers are a gamble, Steve said. You don't know that. And besides, what you're doing isn't a gamble. We've had plenty of advice, and everybody said this was the way to go. That makes you no different than these other people. Did you ever think of that, she said. Help, said Steve to Buddy. She came around to Buddy's side of the table with the hairbrush at her waist, almost as if she would hit him with it. He lowered his eyes to the linoleum floor, then raised them past the slit in her skirt and a small triangle of slip. From there to her eyes, the same color as her near black hair. What's your opinion, she asked. But I remembered that he'd been more disposed to hire a lawyer, at least at first, but there was no sense telling her that. He didn't want her to think he was bragging or to abandon Steve to her criticism. Gathering himself, he said, we have to think about work, what works, and besides that, we're not exactly innocent either. It's good that you're willing to admit it, and it will probably help. She resumed brushing her hair, tilting her head to overcome the resistance, then asked, is Buddy your real name? Buddy's my nickname. Bernard's my real name. It sounds Jewish. I'm Irish, not Jewish. There's nothing wrong with being Jewish or Irish, she said, with a few final brush strokes. 
Her dark hair now framed a heart-shaped face, and her eyes, in the instant since Buddy had noticed their color, darkened even further, as though they'd been painted over. She was perfect in every way, but out of his range, out of his class. Well, that's sort of midway. I'm going to read, I'm going to touch down one more time to uh, a scene in the uh, Big Fritz restaurant across from the Scalzetti's Delta Testament, in which the officer, uh, Mr. D'Angelo, has demanded that the boys give him a personal apology for their behavior. So I'm going to just read so the tail end of that scene. D'Angelo said, Let's get down to cases. You, Antonelli, let's hear what you have to say. I hear you want to be a Marine, but look how you behaved. You want to serve your country, then you should start by respecting the law. I apologize, all right, Steve said. For what? Tell me what you did. For stepping on your hat. You did more than that. I didn't try to take your gun. So it was somebody else? Nobody tried to take your gun, but he said. You don't know that, D'Angelo said. It wasn't me, Steve said, as Buddy's knee pushed against him to quiet him down. So you're calling me a liar, D'Angelo asked. I'm just saying I never went for your gun, Steve said. Somebody did, and you were part of a crime. It's no different than if you drive a getaway car. You're just as guilty as the guy robbing the bank and shooting the teller. But I don't think you're really sorry. Do you realize how much trouble you could have gotten into if I didn't decide to go along? We realize that, and we're sorry, Steve said. For making a fool out of me? For broken bottles and glasses in the street? For all of your stupid friends who wanted to punch me out? For the insults? And at the time, I just tried to send you home? But no, you had to behave like a bunch of punks, and that's what you were. Admit it. At least admit that. We admit it. We both admit it. And you, since, what's your story? What do you have to say for yourself? I never hit you, Buddy said. I never beat you about the face and body like they said that day in court. Okay, I'll apologize for the trouble because I was there. I was part of it. I was one of them, but I never touched you. Somebody had to pay, D'Angelo said. I don't care if you touched me or not. Somebody touched me. Somebody tried to take my gun. I felt it. And besides that, once they bring in a cop fighter, the book is written. As Steve said, would you let me ask you a question? Buddy took his arm and said, no, it's all right. We don't have any questions. D'Angelo said, let him talk. Come on, Antonelli, tell me what's on your mind. I don't want this to be one way. Tell me what you really think. Tightening his grip on Steve's arm to hold him back, Buddy said, so we tell you what we think and you walk away from the deal. We can't do that. D'Angelo leaned back as if to stretch, his hands deep in his jacket pockets. He looked from Buddy to Steve. I'll give you my word. Say anything you want. You might as well, because in a way, that's what you're paying for. Come on, Antonelli, come on, let's see what you've got. He beckoned to Steve with both hands as if getting ready to fight. Steve said, do you think we deserve to be charged with something we didn't do? Wasn't it all a bunch of lies about who did what? A crime was committed and you were caught. It can't be any other way. So you're not responsible? Why should I be responsible? You stopped by my hand. Did we, did we deserve all that? The beating, the phony charges? You did or somebody did. You paid the price, price for your friends. Two guys in a war walk along the road. The shot rings out. One guy dies and the other one lives. There's no justice. It's just the way it is. You got caught and your friends didn't. It's not the same, what he said. D'Angelo said, don't look for me to apologize. It won't happen. You think I owe you something, but you owe me. Do you know what I have to do to clear your names? I have to tell the prosecutor to give two cop fighters a break after what was done to me. I have to say there were so many of you, I couldn't be sure that you two were the ones who beat me up and tried to take my gun. I have to destroy my credibility in front of the judge who's going to say to himself, this cop's been bought. A judge I'll see again and again. And let me tell you something else before I get the hell out of here. I didn't want this. I didn't, a I didn't ask for this way of resolving it. You did. There's an expression you both know, good cop and bad cop. I always wanted to be the good cop, 
but now that's impossible. I tried to be a good cop that night. I gave you and your friends every chance to get the hell out of there, to disperse, go home, but nobody did. So I got myself into this mess with you, with my superiors. I had to play everybody's game. So now I'm corrupt. Do you understand that? Do you understand what you did to me? And you have the nerve to ask me to justify myself? He pushed his coffee forward and stood up and edged into free space. He zipped up his jacket and put up the collar, all the while staring them down, then walked out of the restaurant. Buddy and Steve watched until he disappeared down the subway steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like life along the ground. <laughs> anyway, thank you for. So we thought we'd do a question and answer. Yeah, yeah Charles and I will both uh, maybe Charles will stand up here with me and and uh, you can all fire away. Or can I ask the first question? Yeah. I want to know if the father beans are fresh or dry. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think I've been more and more influenced by um, Asian economy in, in my life. Uh, um, you mean economy first? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, I mean, there's certainly that, that influence from reading poets like Tu Fu and, and all of the high haiku, uh, Isa, and so, so forth. But um, it, it becomes unconscious after a while. And I try not to be too aware of it when I'm, I'm writing. Um, but the more I write, just the, the less I write. This is not the less you say. But you know, even though Vince is saying there's, you know, there's, there's a big difference between prose and prose, you can, you can still, you can still hear the, the cadence in his language and the rhythm. He's, he's, he's got a. A magnificent year for um, economy as well, and fiction and prose, um, that, so that it's moving right along. Um, there's no extra words. Except that I'm rooted. You're flying. You're, oh, you, you take, you know, you take it with ordinary experiences and bring them up to a level. No, I'm still no. down with ordinary experience. That's why I feel about it. No, <laughs> I, uh, you would be that. I'd be, I, I be your rooted. Yeah, really. Yeah. Do you have a little idea? Yeah. Do you have a little plot in your head before you start, or is it one of those things uh, you start writing and it evolves? No, it, it, the plot evolved. I really, it, it evolves once you write it. And I had the I had the central, the core incident in mind. It's something I've been wanting to write about for a long, long time. I've never really been able to get any distance on it. And I started to write, rewrite it again last uh, July, and uh, and I realized I did a much before, when I tried to write about it, I, I could never get beyond the incident. I think now, the way I've written about it, I've finally managed to get all sides of the story. That was my idea, anyway, to make sure that actually they're all, in a way, victim. There's really no way out for anybody in there. So, was this a, an incident that you... Oh, yeah, this is an incident in? that I was very close to <laughs> as a young man. Uh -huh. yeah. But I've never been able to process it in this way. It took me... Years, man. Yeah. Really a long time before yeah. I could get just finally see what I had to do to really write about it. Well, of course, everything is, I mean, the core incident is something I was close to, but the rest of it is just the architecture that I built around it. I mean, the characters and Paula and the grandfather right. and all that stuff is all things that I had to do to make a story out of it. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just be a situation. Yeah. You, know, you, need, you really need to have, it, you can't write anything that's in, I don't know, my kind of writing. You can't write anything simple. You don't want to write a story about police brutality. That's not fine. I mean, that's easy. Right? What, what you really want to write a story is about people who are both sides mm -hmm. have a dilemma. They both sides mm -hmm. have a dilemma. And that's what took me, you know, that's what was hard. That's what, where the work you know, comes in. It's not just a one side, it's just a situation. Otherwise, it's just a situation that's not really that interesting. Yeah, who gets a girl? 
She actually, she convinces Buddy to go back to school. Is sort of how it ends. No, he doesn't get good. She's got a, she's got a boyfriend in law school. So, so that's Paula. 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 Yeah. Paula says about six words that she's as real or more so than anybody else in the board. <laughs> how do you manage that? Uh, or did Paula do it? No, Paula just talks with her hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Paula, Paula was a gift from you know the gods. <laughs> no, and she's actually the kind of she's kind of the catalytic converter in the story. I mean, she's the one that exposes. You know, tells these guys, you know, what are you doing? That exposes the ethics of what of what's going on. But they all have an ethical dilemma, both sides. And that's what I was shooting for. So, so when you write, Vincent, are you able to write great chunks? Do you go back and edit every day? I mean, how do you deal with that part of it? Um, I just it's this constant process of rewriting. Uh -huh. Uh, it's a constant process of uh, it. Just it's just you, it, you write in blocks, and sometimes you, things go along pretty easily, and sometimes they don't. And it's just a constant process of. I mean, I have a computer and a printer, so when I'm really going along, you know, you write, you print out, you work on that, put it up on the screen, print it out again, and there's a lot of stuff you cut out. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, you probably cut out if this is a given length. You probably cut out two or three times that of different incidents, like a whole incident of how Buddy got his job and, right. and you know, this doesn't fit, or how people who came into the Delta Center, I want a character who's an embalmer, a woman, female, and I could never do anything. I always had some of this, I thought she was very funny, but I couldn't do anything with it. So you end up, you end up, you're going up, you go up false, sure. false paths, and you just, if it doesn't work, you just rip it up and you start all over again. You just, it doesn't, it's, you know, it doesn't just go from page one to page 50 like that. And you, I don't know, but that what really happens is kind of like, if you, you have to get to the point where you really feel like you have something. It's like kind of like, it's kind of like, like catching a fish, you know, you're going to get a bite. But it's only when you know you have it on the line. And I, when I finally reached that point here, that I, I realized that I wanted to, that I had the, so the psychological energy to continue with it, that there was something in there that I felt was more than you know what it had been before. So that's how, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just a lot of labor. I mean, really, and any anyone, I mean, yeah. I'm sure Trevor does. And what I'm just going to say, so mm -hmm. poetry, you know, at least superficially, mm -hmm. is you know a poem is a page. Right. You know. Yeah. So what is your process with that? Well, it's, it's very, it's just similar. Yeah. I think all writers go through the same thing with your fiction writer or, mm -hmm. or a poet. That uh, you know, you don't, you really don't discover often the story or the poem until you're halfway through it. You have that initial energy to mm -hmm. start writing. You might, you know, you know, been inspired initially by something. You find out, you know, the next day or three weeks later that it's not. You know, you, it's not about the aardvark you started out writing about. <laughs> You're writing about you want to, more interested in the giraffe. And, uh, that's, and you have to sometimes painfully, as, as uh, instead with the embalmer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pick the from the story or the poem. So, you know, it's just, it's just uh, your mind just takes take over. And, and do, you, do you both love what you do? Uh, well, it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, but I guess everything. I'd probably have to be committed if I couldn't do it. <laughs> no. uh, yes. well, or is it, it satisfying? No, it is. I mean, we, well, we, it's satisfying, yes. Yeah. It's very satisfying once you know, like I say, once you know you've got the fish well, on the, the line, even, the though right, work, yes. even though there's work ahead of you, yeah. and you have a feeling that this is what uh -huh. you want to do, and this is what you yeah. want, and when you get that feeling, you know you're going to do it, and you're committed to it, and you will work. You will work. Mm -hmm. You will work but you, it. but you really do never finally know. I mean, it's I mean, people can say that's bumper or you can get published even. It just reminds me of a great story by the po oh, that uh, John Berryman, the poet, mm -hmm. tells about uh, being a student at Princeton and his, with his teacher John, um, um, with, his, his, uh, with his student W. S. Merwin, who comes up to him after class one day and says, "How do you know? You know, how do you ever know when you've written a great poem?" That was his great, great question. And as an undergraduate, Berryman, you know, looked at it through those 
bottle of glasses and said, if you have to know, stop writing. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of just have to keep going sure. with that faith. Um, I've only met you tonight, yeah. George, but I would be very sorry if you turned into a grief spot on the highway someday. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there an alternative to <laughs> I riding think. while you drive? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the first to say that. Uh, um, I, well, you know, I, I, I really do not look at what I'm writing at, at all. I mean, it's just complete, almost chicken scratch, you know. When yeah, I so that stop. your eyes just yeah, no, I, 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 I'm driving, and I have the, the cruise control, and I, I really just will, you know, write out something very roughly. So, if I had my notebook, I would show you what it looks like. Yeah. But I, no, I, can't, I can't write that way for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Behind you, the other time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there may be times, it's true. <laughs> Having lived in Brooklyn for a time as a young woman, I was struck by the accuracy of the characters you portray mm -hmm. and the details. Yeah. The elevated ones, for example, sounded at me. Well, thank you. People, because, uh, well, that's many people. That's part of the labor of it. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Yes. It is rewarding to hear that because <laughs> I work hard on that. Yes. I, I mean, um, if you heard the first page of this story, uh -huh. uh, it was with the details, unbelievable. Yes. So, so uh, is this book Bible? No. Finished? No, no, this is no, just a book say, No, it's probably finished. I mean, uh, not that I'm. You're still treating it. You're uh -huh. still fooling with it. But no, it's more or less finished. I mean, uh -huh. the story, the story, let's say the story's finished. But is it the same one that we did a scene from? No, one no, 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 you've never seen this one. Now, all the characters, I mean, everything, none of the, I mean, this is a story that none of the characters are really like me in this story. And although all of the characters are like me, of course. <laughs> you write something, you're in all of your characters, but like my book of short stories, a lot of the characters are fairly close to me, but these are characters, every one of them who I, you know, I'm not, you know, buddies and Irish kid. Steve's a small kid who works in a stable, and his father's a, his father's a bookmaker. He actually, you know, if you, I don't know if you got it from that scene with the father. The father arranged all this. The father was chicken coop, a uh, pigeon coop, and father was the one who fixed, made this deal. All. I appreciate it because I was a young bride living in Brooklyn, and for the first time. And it was interesting to see uh, the people, uh, some of whom uh, had perhaps unsavory reputations, <laughs> kind of embraced Street and looked out for me. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. Well, I can't get out. I'm, I'm trying to get out of that world, but somehow I can't. And, you know, <laughs> this is Queens. It's not, you know, it's just a few, few pigeon, pigeon flappings from, uh, from Brooklyn. So, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same. It's all the same thing. It's the same. Same demographic, you could say, uh -huh. uh, in the same time of the year. I mean, time in history in the 60s, these, these neighborhoods are Irish, Italian, and Jewish. Yeah, yeah. And then now they're very different. I'll get parts of this deal with that. So you're in all the other ones, you're not in this one? Not, oh. in, this, not in the direct sense, no. Okay. You're the grandfather. I don't know, because... <laughs> you know, I don't know, because I, I just... I, mean, I guess because these characters have also been on my mind. And it's much, in a way, it's easier to, you can get a better distance on a subject like this if you really don't have a character that you feel, I was there, I did all that. So by looking at the situation through other characters, you, you, you just get, you, I think you do a better job. You just get, a, you just, it's not so icky. It's not so, you know, anyone who's tried to write, if you've tried to write, you know, you start writing about yourself, you say, this is it doesn't, work. it doesn't work, you know. It just doesn't work. Life will not follow art. You know, you've got to. It's much better if you. I mean, all of these characters. You know, are well. You can say, oh, Buddy and Steve. Okay, I knew people like that. The cop is the cop is completely out of my head. So, it's the grandfather. I mean, he's an amalgamation of people that I either saw, met, or heard about. <coughs> Paula is kind of like I say, she was just a gift. Uh, his buddy's father, you know, 
Maybe he's uh, walking around the house saying the rosary, and I just, I don't know where I got him from. <laughs> I got him from, you, sometimes you can start with a, sometimes you can start with me. I mean, I, I try to write about characters and stories, so sometimes with me, I can just look at a person sometimes, and I can, the, just the physical person will give me the character. You know what I mean? If you just see the physical, you don't, you don't even have to know that person. You can see a physical person, and that person will make an impression on you, and suddenly you can kind of move in. You can move in something. Just this is not, not nothing profound. But that's that's the way some of these characters are. Is there, are there any interconnectedness with the stories of lost hearts? Because I thought there was. Mm, there's no, no, no murder in Sicily. There's a murder in Sicily. Well, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Lots of murders in Sicily. Well, yeah. you brought back no. Scalzetti. Yeah. No. Scalzetti. Oh, Scalzetti. Oh, Scalzetti. Yeah, Scalzetti that, does appear in Lost Hearts, right. He, he yeah. does appear in a story called um, the introdu an Introduction to Calculus. Yeah. But the Charlie, the character, is not. Is he right now from Future? Uh, uh, I do. Um, probably half and half. Uh -huh. Is it a particular poet who's influenced you especially? In, na narrative poet or well, just in, in general? Well, narrative and um, Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's, it's 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 hard to you know for me to pinpoint um, uh, specific, uh, yeah. people right off the top of my head, but I I I you know I go I go way back. I mean I go back to I mean when I go back to my my even back to my high school Latin studies when I uh, first was reading Catullus for some sense who got into my you start thinking well who were those poets that really knock you over initially for whatever reason. You know, uh, the lyric poetry of Catullus, you know, I love and I hate. You may ask how this is possible, I don't know, but it's happening right now and it hurts. You know? So um, from Catullus to, oh, I remember in, you know, in high school loving E. Cummings for, for a long time and then loving Frost. You know, you go all, just go all over the place and then, you know, discovering Whitman who, you know, so the, who wrote like Ginsburg and um, Ginsburg wrote right like him, of course, and so then then you then you finally have to find your own line, your own breath, and your own. Uh, but I, if I had to say one poet who I just keep going back to over and over again, and I don't really write like very much, but who I just am sort of eternally enamored by and I'm intrigued by, would be Emma Dickinson. Oh, that's interesting. That's Chandler and Heinrich Bull. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's reading the biography. I just finished his biography, but I keep my son gave me two complete works of Raymond Chandler and two volumes. Great. Great. So I have all. I have his first. I just read his biography. Yeah. Uh, pretty sad, but anyway, I have everything he's written. I, I don't know if I've read it all. He did, he wrote a lot of letters and essays that are really interesting. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah he has a book. I has a book called. Uh, Raymond Chandler speaking, it's kind of hard to get. It's all, he was an inveterate letter writer. He wrote all about, he has a lot to say about writing, about his writing, about the difference between you know literary novels and mystery novels and what's the difference. And, uh, I, I really, I mean, there are some writers that you, you latch on to because of their lives, not only because of the way they write, but because of their lives. With Bull, it's the way he writes. He's incredibly sensitive. He knows exactly. He can get deep into a character so fast. And I read that. I still study it. I mean, that's what I do. Why writers like that, I try to study them. I mean, I read them for enjoyment, but then I say, how do they do that? You try to pick, you try to pick it apart, and then you end up trying to well, you sort of imitate it. I mean, you know, we're all writing. You write, we all have, 
you have the English language with us and you know, sentences and a certain kind of grammar, so you're in, you have a structure. And within that, you know, there is a certain imitation that goes on. Not conscious. Right. It's not consciously imitated, but you know, you, you know, you can take a passage from some a writer that you really love and say, God, it's so beautiful. How do they do that? And so you you try to emulate, you know, you do it, you try to imitate that. It's not it's not like copying, but it is like They're trying to do what you're trying. I mean, you're trying to do what they're trying. What they've succeeded at. What they're trying to do. So, you try to learn something. And in fact, I, if I don't think I'm going to learn learn anything, I won't, I don't like to read anything. If I don't think I'm going to learn something about writing, uh, about why they did it, how they did it. You know, you read some books. Say, how the hell did they do that? <laughs> I read a long time ago. I read uh, Little Big Man. It's in, on Cape Cod, one of these rental houses on the local library. And Little Big Man. About you know, this kid gets kidnapped by the Indians, but Cheyenne Indians, and that's like Custer, you know, it's like a stuff going on. I was just totally stunned by this book. I actually, as soon as I got to the last page, I went back to the first page. And, I read the book. and actually, yeah, and, I, and I, then I figured it out. You know, I saw how he did it, and I found a book on Cheyenne Indians that he used the same names in the book, same names, these Indian names. You know, he'd just taken this book about, the, you know, he'd use all the names, and I said, okay, well, that wasn't that part. <laughs> no, that could be done. It wasn't that, you know, it wasn't a real mystery. Right, right. So, I don't know. I, I, I like to read things that I think will teach me something. Sometimes you reread things that uh, you didn't like at first. Yeah. Like, like Gatsby, that you discovered. Right, I, yeah, I, I would have to say I, I did Gatsby short shrift at first. And then you read Gatsby. I don't believe it now, okay? <laughs> okay, obviously. <laughs> yeah, there's a bar, bar in Madison where Fitzgerald used to hang out and sit in the bar really? and see where he scratched his name into the bar. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 it is a great book. Yeah. You do know, of course, that little don't you know? Yeah. That's the way Brown's the way Brown's the way. Well, <laughs> well, when, I, when I said drum and bird, and I said, you know, the male does the drum, that drumming sounds like a lawnmower starting up and then just quitting all of a sudden. And then they do they do that little dozen. Yeah. Well, I guess anyway. Well, well, thank you for coming. We could break some books to sell. Or? Yeah. Well, I do have some books. Yeah. 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 Yeah.